taking notes. We just recorded it so we can get it into the record the way we're supposed to. Um, and feel free to put your name in the chat and uh, maybe where you're from, who you're with, or any of that type of stuff that's good identifying information. And uh, if you also, you know, don't want to speak up publicly and, and, you know, want to put private notes to us and questions or anything in private or want to give us a call later or uh, email me later as well, you're more than welcome to do that. Uh, you know, that way I know everybody doesn't necessarily want to speak publicly sometimes. Uh, so with that, um, thank you for coming. And I'm going to share my screen. I want to talk a little bit about, um, you know, NRCS. And I think a lot of you, I, I see most recognize most all the faces here. And I still just want to tell you about, you know, who NRCS is, what we do, our history, um, you know, what the basis of the local work group meeting is and what we're trying to accomplish. So I'm going to kind of run through that a little bit. And then um, we can talk about that and get done. So let me see if I can share my screen. Great. Is everybody seeing that? Looks good. Perfect. So, um, so yeah, welcome to the meeting here. Let's see if I can, oops. So again, local work group meeting is something we've done for a long time here at NRCS and um, being a locally led process, the intent of the local work group meeting is to get together with partners, with uh, producers, with general public, stakeholders, anybody who's interested in conservation in Jackson County to help us sort of, you know, decide where we should be prioritizing our resources and our efforts and, you know, what type of resource concerns and how we want to partner together. So, you know, in a nutshell, we really want to go over what we've been doing the last year or so. Uh, again, help shape what we're doing going forward and priorities with, with input. Um, and we want to connect to new partners and new audience members and uh, figure out how we can leverage our work and what we're doing moving forward. Uh, the days of us, you know, going it alone and doing, doing this work by ourselves are long gone. You know, we are obviously working in deep partnership and trying to leverage our funds. And um, so this is a great opportunity to just kind of showcase what we're doing and bring more people in. Um, want to also just let you know what we're doing and see if we can do a little better with it um, and then get good ideas and grab, gather input from producers, partners, and uh, everybody else who would want to have any type of interest in what we're doing. Again, locally led. Uh, so I think most of you know about the NRCS a little bit, but we were formed back in mid-30s during the Dust Bowl days, grapes of wrath type of stuff. Uh, everybody moved out to the Midwest, started planting, you know, grain and commodity crops in million-year-old grassland, and massive erosion started happening. And uh, it pretty became pretty obvious that, that there was a big issue that needed to be addressed. And so they created a federal agency that was originally called the Erosion Control Service, and we were set up to basically help the local producers that were having issues. And those local groups that had different resource concerns in different areas uh, we were there to help connect with technical and financial resources, but ultimately we want to take our, our you know, our inst not instruction, but, you know, guidance and help doing what they were doing locally. And so those groups still exist today. And they're probably what you guys know as the Soil and Water Conservation Districts. So they're our oldest partner. And so we continue to work with them, trying to set local priorities. And, you know, the folks that do what we do, say in Pendleton, same program, same type of staffing, but they're not working on the same type of issues and resource concerns. And that's what's nice about the locally led process. Uh, we work with private agricultural landowners. It's uh, voluntary and non-regulatory, which is great. Uh, it's free. We provide technical and financial resources in a lot of cases through farm build programs, planning, uh, a lot of things we don't do a lot of around here, and I'll touch on them a little bit, but we just don't do a lot of conservation easements and, you know, other things, but we do offer them. And uh, some of the other things that we're really well known for are the snow soil, or the snow survey, as well as the soil surveys. And uh, we've had a couple name changes over the years. We were for, formerly the Erosion Control Service, and then a lot of the old timers know us as the Soil Conservation Service. And I want to say, I think it was about 1996, we became fully the Natural Resources Conservation Service. Uh, again, a couple of things that just touch on that we do that I think we're pretty well known for that is, brings a lot of value to a lot of people is we are the ones um, through the NRCS Cooperative Snow Surveys. We've been doing this, I think, since about 1938. And uh, again, it's cooperative. We have, we work with irrigation districts and other groups and parties that want to help us get this information. And it's great information uh, for irrigation, for hydropower, flood control, recreation, fish and wildlife. And uh, you'll forgive me, this slide is a, a couple about a week old, but this is our base and outlook for our snow water equivalent. And so right now in the Rogue Umpqua, we're about 90% of average 
based on a 30 year average for our, so not so bad. Looks like East and a little bit North looks absolutely fantastic though, up and especially in up uh, Umatilla Walla Walla. So a little jealous. And then uh, another thing we do, it brings a lot of value to a lot of people and it's very, we're very well known for is the soil surveys. And uh, we had several soil scientists lived in this county for a number of years, a number of years ago, and they mapped and did it all. And what's absolutely amazing, if you're not familiar with the web soil survey, is uh, they had digitized the entire soil survey and put it onto the interwebs or the internet. Uh, amazing tool here. So if you're not familiar with the web soil survey or want any kind of, uh, you know, little tutorial on how to use it and, you know, get access to basically great maps and all the soil survey and information you could imagine, please let me know. Uh, so a few years ago, uh, Oregon for a long time, we would do what I would describe as say, you know, random acts of conservation. And we'd have local work, we'd have local work groups, we'd help identify what our resource concerns we really wanted to get to were. And, you know, around in Jackson County for as long as I've been here, you know, the really two predominant resource concerns we look at um, that people want us to help address are water quality and, you know, uh, fuels and, and basically wildfire hazard. And so, uh, if you were anywhere in the county, you know, 10 years ago, and you had pre-commercial private agriculture, you know, private non-industrial forest land, you want to do some thinning or some fuels reduction, we would do that. But we ended up with having a lot of different programs and, you know, results in place and projects that weren't really connected. And so at the end of this investment, the question was, you know, what do you have to show for it? And we didn't have a lot. We had good projects individually, but we didn't have a lot of really landscape level outcomes. So about 10 years ago, uh, we moved to what we call the strategic approach to conservation. And the idea is we want to invest strategically. We want to partner. We want to have a focus area. We want to find partners who want to work for the same outcome. Uh, we want to leverage these funds, our funds, you know, with technical assistance and financial assistance. We want to really come out with a landscape level outcome based result. And so that's what we've been doing here for the last uh, you know, really going on about 10 years and it's been working very, very well, I would say. Uh, so as I said, it's, it's a very partner centric approach. Uh, we try to, again, leverage funds and I know I've kind of mentioned this, but, uh, and focus and targeted. And so instead of having random acts of conservation, a good example is our fuel reduction, having 20 acres and talent and 40 out in Rogue River and things that weren't connected, you know, we're looking at a landscape level. So we're picking, you know, more larger landscape priority areas where we really can dig in and over you know four or five six year period or however long you know this is going to happen we can work to leverage as much outcome and when we get done we may have thin 30 percent of the private non-industrial forest land for example in in a high priority area and so our outcome is much different when that question gets asked uh, and and you know it's hopefully very science-based and the other thing is we like using it because hopefully with any luck the monitoring that we're doing as well is to help us, you know, inform future projects moving forward. So we feel like it's working really pretty well. Uh, and, you know, at the base of the strategic approach to conservation is what we call a conservation implementation strategy. And, uh, you know, it, it's just really what it sounds like. We are trying to come up with a plan that essentially we start with identifying the resource concerns, figuring out what they are. And, and a lot around here, a lot of it is wildfire hazard and forest health, uh, water quality, soil health, wildlife resource concerns. And so in this plan, it's the guidance document. It could be anywhere from a five page plan to a you know 20 page plan, depending on what's in it. We're trying to set our goals, uh, evaluate alternatives, establish partner roles, uh, develop at that point too. Also, we really wanna develop the implementation plan. And so within all the projects we do, we have a ranking criteria to figure out how we're gonna to get to the most valuable projects that we feel you know, have the most value and work our way down the list. We figure what the group of practices we're going to use to address the resource concerns. We try to figure out how we're gonna address the NEPA concerns and uh, it just gets all rolled into this big plan that we call an implementation strategy. And again, it's, uh, it's really our guidance document without a, a, a conservation implementation strategy that's been approved, we're never really gonna get to being able to fund uh, type of thing. And, and what we use with the conservation implementation strategies, we're really always starting with a, you know, some sort of guidance document to help us address the resource concerns. So it might be, for example, the Inland Rogue Ag Water Quality Management Plan to try to help identify where some of these bigger problems might be, or the Rogue Basin Rogue base Cohesive Forest Restoration Strategy, or 
plan a Siskiyou Oak Network strategic action plan. You know, there's just a lot of it that we can dial into that's, you know, work that's been done really helps us identify where we're trying to get to. Uh, and a lot of people pushing in the same direction. Uh, and so we try to also obviously identify an outcome, you know, an outreach strategy. And, um, you know, this is this big plan. Uh, do we have any questions about CISs a little bit before I kind of get into what we're currently doing? I know I'm kind of going a little bit quick here. If anyone has any questions, feel free to unmute or go ahead and type them in the chat and we'll cover them as they come in. Thanks. Okay. Um, so currently we have a couple of current uh, conservation implementation strategies we're working with in Jackson County. We have our Green Springs Forest Health and Fuels Reduction, which we've been working really hand in hand with Oregon Department of Forestry. And we also are continuing to work on the Bradshaw Drop Agricultural Water Quality Improvement Project and working really hand in hand uh, with the Jackson Soil and Water Conservation District. Now I'll, I'll kind of highlight a little bit of those, what we're doing, but uh, a couple past recent uh, Jackson County CISs that we've implemented pretty successfully that you guys may be familiar with is uh, the Ashland Forest All Lands or the AFAR project where we came in working with the Ashland Forest Resiliency and we worked on private land interspersed with the public lands in the entire AFR. I think we ended up treating roughly about 4,000 acres through the Ashland Forest, wa Ashland Watershed. It was, it was, it was a great, uh, really, really, really good outcome, I thought. And uh, that was funded through the Joint Chiefs Program, which is a combination of the Chiefs of the Forest Service as well as the Natural Resources Conservation Service. Um, we recently figured, uh, finished up the Klamath Rogue Oak Woodland Health and Habitat Conservation Project. Uh, and that was pretty groundbreaking as well. That was uh, across three counties in two states. We were in Siskiyou County as well as Douglas County. And uh, that was under the Regional Conservation Partnership Program. In we've also recently finished a seven basins fuel forest health and fuels reduction project and that was out through Pleasant Creek and uh, Evans Creek and Wards Creek and that whole area around Rogue River that uh, was very high priority. And we also had finished up the original Little Butte Creek Ag Water Quality Project, which led into what is the Bradshaw Drop Agricultural Water Quality Project. So um, perhaps some of you have worked through some of those and with us on those. So. Currently, what we're working on right now uh, is the Green Springs Forest Health and Fuels Reduction. And uh, let me see if I can get this out of my way here. Uh, so working hand in hand with Oregon Department of Forestry, we identified the entire Green Springs area, including some of these areas down the southeast, which was part of the Oregon Gulch fire, uh, to come in. And what we want to do is fuels reduction through the area. And so the majority of practices we're doing with the private landowners really encompass the forest stand improvement, which is the cutting. Uh, some pruning if it's needed in some of the younger stands, slash treatment, and we've been creating some wildlife piles. We also have, you know, other practices that we are able to use, including uh, site prep and tree and shrub establishment. We kind of designated that area for folks that were in the Oregon Gulch fire, uh, but so far we, we really haven't had a lot of signups in there. Um, it's been very successful in, in terms of conservation implementation strategies and partnership and outreach and everything we would want it to be. And uh, not to mention the community up there is very cohesive and um, I, I can't really keep up with the interest and it's exactly what we want. That's why we want to work in this strategic location and we wanna get as many neighbors next to each other and get as big of an impact on the land. And so uh, last year alone, we contracted 14 landowners uh, for roughly about 430 acres of fuel reduction work and we obligated roughly $586,000. Uh, through the three full years we've been doing this, we've contracted with 26 private landowners uh, doing work on just under 1,500 acres, and we're up to about a million point four uh, on the obligation. We still have this year and next year, and uh, we may, in fact, see with any luck if we can extend it one more year as it's been just going so well and we're making great headway with it. And uh, really kudos and hats off to with our partnership with Oregon Department of Forestry. They have been carrying a, a very large load through. We have a statewide agreement with them for technical services and they do a great job helping us with plans and inspections and the outreach. And uh, we really couldn't have, have, have been as successful without them as well. I just wanna point that out. Uh, the other active CIS that we have working right now is out in the Bradshaw Drop Irrigation Improvement Project. And this is coming down Little Butte Creek uh, along the 140 area, working hand in hand with Jackson Soil and Water Conservation District. Uh, big kudos to Paul DiMaggio, who is the engineer 
at uh, soil and water conservation districts really been helping us with a lot of uh, design work and implementation inspection and uh, really, really uh, helping us quite a bit. The intent out there was to address water quality issues that they were having. And so for us, there are a lot of folks and a lot of partners that can do in-stream work, can do riparian work, but that's not where we fit in. Again, with the, the idea of working in a strategic approach, we want to bite off the part we can handle and we're good at let the other folks do the parts they're good at. And so what we're helping people do is convert from flood irrigation to sprinkler irrigation and teaching them how to use the water properly through implementation of irrigation water management practices. And we're trying to reduce the tailwater that may be sediment laden, high temperatures from the summer. Uh, it could be, you know, the, the flood irrigation would be 20 to 30% effect, uh, you know, efficient. So there's a lot of water getting wasted and water quality, uh, water quantity is water quality. And so at the end of the day, we're trying to put as, keep as much water in the stream, keep the tailwater from going back into the streams. And then hopefully the uh, on-farm folks um, are also getting, you know, an improvement in their efficiency as well as their productivity. So uh, it's been pretty much a win-win for everybody. Uh, do we have any questions about any of those CISs, what we're doing uh, currently before I go on? Nope. Not seeing okay. any questions in the chat. No. Well, and uh, really quickly too, we were just going to put up one poll question, just kind of wanted to get an uh, idea of who everybody was with and representing. And uh, so... Maybe you could just uh, go ahead and. Yep, the poll question's launched. We've got just a couple questions. Um, who yeah. are you, who are you representing today? And then what type of land use are you most interested in? Which ones do you work the most in? And both questions are multiple choice if you represent more than one. Okay. Those, those are results, Kylie? Yep, those are our results. So we've got a good, good mix. Fantastic. So, you know, I, I'd like to also touch on, um, you know, a big effort between partners that's being made right now for a future CIS we're in development of. And so I want to kind of share that. It's a uh, in light of the Almeda fire and uh, you know the imminent danger that's going on to our communities, this, this seemed like a very well-timed uh, implementation strategy. So I'd like to just mention that a little bit. So we are working with... Hey, Peter, it looks like you accidentally muted yourself. There we go. There we go. Okay, good. Uh, I don't know, I'll start over. I don't know where I, I left you. So, you know, in light of the Almeda fire and the obvious danger to our communities and the forest, uh, this, this seemed like a very well-timed partnership to come together. Uh, working within priorities of the Rogue Basin Cohesive Forest Restoration Strategy, uh, the area really west of Bear Creek from, if you look from really, north of Wagner Creek Road all the way to Jacksonville on the west side of the valley was one of the highest single priorities identified in the Rogue Basin Cohesive Forest Restoration Strategy. And so came together with a lot of partners, including the Rogue Forest Partners, Lomakotsi Restoration Project, Sustainable Northwest, uh, the Southern Oregon Extension Service, uh, as well as Oregon Department of Forestry and a lot of other really, really skilled individuals. Uh, and what we're proposing right now, and we've written a implementation strategy is what we're calling the West Bear All Lands Restoration Project. And again, what we're trying to do is more than just fuel reduction and trying to reduce fires, we, we'd like to reduce risk to communities as well. And so what's unique about this partnership is we wanna work with not just the upland private landowners, but we want to work with a lot of the smaller landowners, folks along the roads. If you know this area very well, there are a lot of very small uh, 
roads in there. It's a, the ingress egress is very scary. There's probably 4,000 homes in the wilderness urban interface and it's right basically right on the on the valley floor. And so uh, this just all seemed very well timed. There was a lot of momentum especially. And uh, so again, what we did once we've written this, uh, our Lomakotsi was the lead sponsor and they've applied for a regional conservation partnership program grant. And uh, we, we have not heard, we're hopeful, but there's going to be some work. And there's also the SWIFT initiative, which is uh, the Southwest Integrated Forest and Fire Treatment Initiative that was launched by the Sustainable Northwest, if you're familiar with them, they're an NGO. And um, they have a philanthropic donor who wanted to bring in several million dollars to help with fuels reduction in this area as well. So the partnership just kind of grew from there, from people who are interested, people who had financial resources as well as technical resources. And then there's also an overlay. I don't know if you can see my uh, cursor here, but the uh, theme of the Federal Emergency Management Agency had granted through Lomakotsi uh, a $500,000 grant for dispensable spaces in this area around Anderson Creek. And so there's a lot of overlays. And in, in the past, we've really just focused on fuels reduction and trying to reduce wildfire hazard, but here we're really trying to help reduce the risk to communities as well. Uh, another interesting thing about our proposal is that with some of the potential private money, we, we might have an access to help get work done with folks who are either not great for NRCS programs, may have an acre or less, or may not want to participate, um, where we can get some of this work done in coordination with what we're trying to do. So uh, I, I really feel good about it, and the time is right, and there's a lot of interest, and we have a lot of support from uh, the municipalities as well. So uh, we'll let you know if that happens. We have a lot of interest and uh, we have a lot of people that have had forestry plans developed by Oregon Department of Forestry in that area. So I really think this is, um, I think this has a lot of big, big potential to really do a lot of work and help not just the landowners, but everybody in this valley. Uh, let's see here. Um, I don't know if there are any, any questions on that. That's kind of a big, kind of a big rollout. If we can make it happen is quite, optimistic. So I don't know if anybody has any questions on this or I can should just continue to move on a little bit. One quick question in the chat. Um, could you point out where to see info on past initiatives? Yeah, I'm sure it's, uh, we have it on our website, I believe on uh, in NRCS Oregon under programs and strategic approach, there is a button that says what's available in my county. And I believe that's where they archive the past initiatives. Um, I don't I'll put know that Nate, in the chat. Yeah, Nate, I don't know if you uh, want to chime in here, perhaps, if I have that correct. Okay. I wasn't um, sure if they also had mentioned, um, oh, it sounds like you're looking to go through some of those too, so, okay. Oh, no, I can have, have, I was just going to talk, I was just going to talk about some of our actual, our programs as well, just kind of back into that a little bit. Okay, I'll just follow up the because the initiatives are part of probably in your presentation too. So yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Heather. Uh, so NRCS two is uh, you know we're we're known for some of the programs that we offer through the Farm Bill. Uh, the largest one that I think most people are familiar with is what we call the Environmental Quality Incentives Program or EQIP. It's really our heavy lift program, uh, and, and this is when we end up with a conservation implementation strategy area and we end up contracting individuals, this is the program we use. And we've been using this program successfully for a long time. Uh, folks that come in under the Regional Conservation Partnership Program, when we, if we end up getting that type of, those type of dollars, they also end up with an EQIP contract. Uh, there's also national initiatives. And where I've been talking about strategic approach and conservation implementation strategies and landscape level treatment, we also have a few national initiatives that are a little bit stand more standalone, uh, as I think they figure you're probably pretty high priority if you're doing some of these things. So I, uh, you know, while there are some other things we don't do a lot of, I would just cover uh, some of the national initiatives that we do uh, here locally. And then we also have, and I'll get to that in a moment, the conservation stewardship program is also uh, a program we've had for a long time now. And this is a little bit different than the programs that we offer a lot of times in the past, if you didn't have some sort of problem, we could help you address. We really didn't have any type of, you know, financial assistance. And the conservation stewardship program was designed to help folks who are doing good stewardship. 
had been documenting it, really doing everything just about right. And what this program does is it allows them to come in and gives them a base payment for the stewardship they're doing and to continue to maintain it. And then we give them a chance to add what we call enhancement uh, practices to actually take that level of stewardship a little bit higher and we give them some financial uh, incentives to do so. And uh, it's it's been a good program. It's a little bit of an acreage-based program. And so I think some of the adoption in uh, East Side and some of the other areas has been a little bit bigger, but we are definitely, um, now that we've been working with people through the EQIP project process to get them to this level of stewardship, this is starting to look like a good fit. And so with any luck, we're going to start ramping up participation in this program. Uh, then for years, we've all, as I mentioned, we've all offered technical assistance. You want to call me up about soils or snow or pasture, or, you know, anything you want to do, we're happy to just give you technical assistance if we can. And, uh, you know, part of the great art of what we do is I don't need to know everything, but I need to know where to find out. And we have great partners and just a great wealth of information. And so that's good. Uh, some other programs that we do, and we don't, we don't do a lot of around Jackson County is um, we have an, we have an easement program, um, that, you know, for putting land, stewardship land into permanent easements. And, you know, th that happens a little bit more up north, I think, in a bit of little east. And, you know, maybe somebody else who, who does a little bit more might want to chime in here. I don't know. Uh, we also have the Conservation Reserve Enhancement Program, or CREP. Well, that's not our program. That's a farm service agency program. The intent is to protect water quality along stream channels and ponds and, 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 and different types of thing. And the intent is to basically take those lands that are out of production, create a you know a riparian buffer, uh, fence out the animals if there are animals, uh, give people a you know a long a, a payment rate of for the land that they're not being able you know not using at that time, and um, you know basically just get it back into a functioning riparian area. Uh, we also have the regional conservation partnership program, which is that's a large national program that we tie into to try for some funding uh, to fund some of these larger CISs that are more regional in nature. And like I mentioned, this whole West Bear project, uh, we're currently in the process of trying to get uh, RCPP funding through, through the lead sponsor. It's a partner driven program uh, where they, you know, in, in this case, uh, Loma Kotz is, is, is the sponsor partner. And then we have the conservation innovation grants. And that's also a really interesting program where they put out to bid and folks that want to come up with innovative practices and ideas and, and management and other ideas of how to implement innovative technologies. And I think the intent is to then hopefully bring it back to things that NRCS can adopt in our practice standards if we get there. So if anybody has interest in conservation innovation grant um, or CRAP or easement programs, you know, I'm happy to chat with you and uh, let you know all about it. So let me talk to you too real quick and I'll get finished up here uh, about national initiatives. And again, these are also equip programs, uh, what we do here locally that aren't really necessarily geographically based. Uh, so one that we're known for is a national organic initiative. And this is great. We have a lot of small farms here and truck farms, people growing vegetables, uh, things like that. And so the idea is if you are certified or transitioning to organic or what they're considering to be exempt, and I think the number is under $5,000 worth of sales a year, then you're potentially eligible. And so we're able to give you planning and then in some cases, financial assistance to help implement conservation practices that are really unique to the organic production method. Um, and people obviously have to maintain an organic system plan as well. And so you can see we, we do cover crop, irrigation water management, residue management, livestock watering, uh, crop rotations, hedgerow pollinators. That's, that's a big thing we've been getting into with a lot of local folks is pollinator hedgerows, uh, permanent, which is really nice. Um, it's been helping a lot of folks out. And um, I know we have a lot of interested parties and pollinators are, uh, you know, in wildlife habitat is a pretty big concern. So um, we're glad to be able to do that. And we'd like to actually start doing more of it if possible. And then another uh, national initiative that we've been quite successful with here is a seasonal high tunnel program. And what the intent of that is to extend the growing season to, to basically help improve local food systems. So if you're supplying food to farmers markets, schools, CSAs, you know, anything type of local, you know, you're, you're potentially eligible. And we just want to improve the local food system as much as we can. And uh, we do prioritize a little bit and the folks in the colder areas and the lesser growing degree days that uh, will get a little bit more priority. And uh, so we have, I would probably say we've probably worked with probably 
20 producers over the last 10 years doing high tunnels locally. It's been, been very well received. Uh, and so kind of the end of my presentation, feel free to contact me really about anything. If you have questions, concerns, needs, um, you know, want to talk about any of our programs, priorities, what we're doing, just don't want to do it in a public setting, you can always contact me. And uh, that's a very old picture. It was a very happy donkey. I was a very young employee back then. I just love that picture. So I thought I would share it. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. So, um, so does anybody have any questions at this point about, you know, just who we are, what we do, uh, you know, bigger picture type of ticket items? And, and again, the, the, the goal of, the pro of today is to really dive in and I, I would want to get input from our local partners and interested parties and try to help set our priorities and figure out where we want to be going and what we want to, how we want to invest moving forward. So that's really the goal. Um, of that. Any questions? Anybody? <laughs> Yay, pollinators, Callie. I knew you'd like the pollinators, Callie. Uh, so at this point, I think we're running a little bit early, but that's OK, because usually I think a lot of times maybe the whole discussion and stakeholder input part goes a little bit longer. So I'm glad to have a little bit longer. Uh, at this point, um, I think I'd like to introduce Megan uh, Montgomery from the Jackson Soil Water Conservation District, as well as Clint Nichols. And uh, I don't know if Paul is going to say anything, but uh, our partners, our oldest partners is the Jackson Soil and Water Conservation District, and they were going to give an update and uh, just let you know where they're at a little bit. So, uh, Megan, if you and Clint want to take over. So I hear Megan talking, she's muted. So why don't Clint, <laughs> why don't you start? No red shirt, but we'll still let you go, Clint. <laughs> um, yeah, okay. So is it, a, is it possible for me to share my screen, Peter? Uh, do you have a thing? I, I do, yeah, okay, cool. Uh um, so yeah, so I think, hi, so I guess I should introduce myself. I think everybody here knows me, but just in case you don't, my name is Clint Nichols. I'm with Jackson Soil and Water Conservation District. Uh, I'm the forest and riparian resource conservationist here with the district. Um, again, I think most people know who we are. So uh, today what we really wanted to focus on was a couple, uh, essentially what we wanted to do is we wanted to pitch a couple of ideas um, for some future CISs and some uh, other future programs. Um, that we'd like to get our partners uh, support on. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the work that we've done out in the open chain fire area. And, um, and then after that, uh, Megan uh, is gonna talk a little bit about uh, some of the, the hemp work that we'd like to see done down here in Jackson County as well. Um, uh, so yes, yeah, so let me share my screen real quick. Um, Again, I think most people know who we are, so I don't want to spend a whole lot of time talking about talking about the district. Uh, does everybody see that? Okay. Good. Yeah, I'm seeing seeing some nodding heads, so that's good. Um, oh, hang on. All right. So yeah. So um, early on, I'm, I'm not going to talk too much about the open chain fire in and of itself. I think a lot of us here probably um, know a little bit about kind of what was going on. So the South, actually I should say the South Oban chain fire um, hit back in September. This week is actually, interestingly enough, this week is actually the six month anniversary of both the Alameda and the Oban, South Oban chain fires. Um, hang on just a second. Okay, her class is over. I'm competing bandwidth with uh, my kid who's working from home or doing school from home today. So say hi. Hi. <laughs> Um, anyway, so early on after all of the fires, um, you know, there was a ton of work that needed to be done. And so, um, and there was some really good resources that came out to try and help get some of this work done, namely the Oregon Watershed Enhancement Board put in $75,000 for 
uh, for both the Almeida, uh, $175,000 grant for both Almeida and for OpenChain. Um, and so, you know, that, that funding was predicated on um, one agency taking the lead and working on each of those fires. And so based on a lot of the work that uh, had happened earlier before that grant offering had come out, it really made a lot of sense that the district would take the lead on uh, a lot of the fire recovery efforts for South Oban Chain. And then the Rogue River Watershed Council and John Spies, who's on the call today, would take the lead on some of the recovery efforts for the Almeida fire. Um, and I talk about that simply because um, in the of the 14 sort of mega fires that impacted the state, the South Oban Chain fire has been one of these fires that has largely gone under the radar. A lot of the landowners have expressed that they haven't really seen, uh, you know, a lot of people talking about it. it hasn't been as much, uh, uh, much, as much emphasis out there to get some, get some uh, help and some recovery done for the landowners. Um, but there's enormous amount of, F of interest and I'll, I'll get to a slide here in a minute. So let me just dive in a little bit and talk a little bit about kind of what we've seen in the last six months that we've done uh, some work out in the, in the Butte Falls area. Um, so again, I think all of you know kind of a little bit about the South Open Chain Fire, but just so you, if you don't really know, it started on South Open Chain Road, sort of burned northwest towards Shady Cove. Heavy impacts throughout like the Butte Falls Highway area, North Open Chain Road, Derby Road, all throughout that area. Some of the major watersheds that were impacted were uh, particularly Reese Creek, North and South Fork Reese Creek. Um, Knutchen Creek, uh, a little bit on Lick Creek. So some of these watersheds uh, basically west of Butte Falls. Luckily, it didn't uh, burn towards the actual city of Butte Falls. It was all pretty much west of Butte Falls. Um, so again, so in the last six months, we've done a number of, what, of, of site visits. This area provided a lot of technical assistance to landowners. And this is just a summary of some of the things that we're seeing out there. A lot of hazard trees, a lot of snags still hung up. Um, you know, trees broken, blown over from the wind that were fire compromised or dead. Um, erosion is a concern out there, though we haven't really seen uh, a lot of major uh, soil movement in that area, but we're still taking a lot of steps to uh, shore up soils, particularly around streams or on steep slopes. Um, we're definitely concerned about pine beetle outbreaks. A lot of the forest that was burned out there was particularly heavily uh, uh, pine forested. And so, and pine beetle is something that we've been struggling with down in Southwest Oregon for, for I don't know, how long has pine beetle been around? Um, so that's something that we're concerned about. You know, that's something that we probably won't see for at least another year or two uh, as far as how bad it is, but um, that's something that we've been working with landowners to uh, get managed. A lot of dozer, dozer lines were cut in, uh, cat lines. Uh, the logger militia actually did a, a ton of effort. This is essentially a bunch of landowners that just took it upon themselves with the equipment they had to defend homes and, and forested property, particularly out on North Oban Chain Road. Um, and so they put in a lot of, of fire lines to protect homes and protect property. Um, and that's great, uh, but now we need to come back in and you know protect some of those soils from erosion, uh, weed outbreaks and then that slash treating some of that slash you know uh, that kind of leads into the next topic about invasive species annual grasses are are always a problem out there everything from the medusa head uh, uh, and some of the other you know bromes that we have out there and then of course down in the riparian areas uh, blackberry and then as things start to regrow we could almost treat some of the ceanothus and manzanita and the small diameter um, Doug fur that are going to grow back as as an invasive species because of the density at which they grow back. Um, and then, of course, you know, not to all of this is not to diminish the, the just the loss of timber resource and the, and the wildlife habitat in a lot of these burnt stands. So. So I mentioned earlier uh, that we had an amazing uh, 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 turnout uh, uh, stemming from some outreach that we did. So. Kara Baylog with OSU Extension uh, put, helped put together a packet of resource materials for landowners affected by the fire. Um, included, uh, you know, some information from us, from NRCS, from FSA, from ODF, um, and then actually included a landowner, a, a letter from one of the local landowners up there, um, basically 
sort of vouching for the agencies uh, that were included in that packet. Um, so had about 194 land or private landowners that were impacted out in that area. And, and I'm, we're pretty sure that most of those landowners received this, this contact material. And of that, uh, we heard about 64 landowners um, that were either, that they responded to, to, that, to that packet, they contract, contacted the district directly because they knew about us from pr prior to the fire, um, or they were referred to the district by other landowners. Um, which is a huge response. Um, anybody who's ever done outreach knows that that kind of response is sort of outside the norm of statistical significance. Um, so of that 64 landowners that we've uh, made contact with, we've been able to do uh, site visits um, for 45 of them. Um, and of that, and again, providing some that site visit, some technical assistance. Uh, we still have 19 that we're still struggling to contact. Some of these are people are absentee landowners that live out of state or out of county. Um, some of them lost their homes, and so it's been difficult to to make that contact while they're still, you know, dealing with all of the the personal issues related to losing your home. Um, uh, so uh, we had two programs essentially that were designed to provide some immediate assistance. One, uh, Megan. Um, my coworker Megan Montgomery, who's going to talk in a second here, uh, took the initiative to bulk purchase a bunch of seed and straw um, that we basically handed out to landowners for free. Their match was the labor to get it out on the ground. And then uh, through the Oregon Watershed Enhancement Board funds that we got and our own uh, uh, our own internal grant program, we were able to work out a, a MOU with ODF, the, the ODF fuels reduction crew that uh, does uh, fuels reduction in defensible space around homes. Um, and we have uh, we have eleven landowners that are going to receive that have or are going to receive in the next couple of weeks some um, really targeted forestry work. Um, so that's kind of the work that we've done so far. I've got a couple of numbers here for you. So as part of that seed and straw distribution, we put out about 2,500 pounds of dry pasture seed. So this is a mix that's designed to recover rangelands, particularly to try and exclude, uh, uh, again, those annual grasses. Um, that's about 56 acres worth of, worth of seed about 3,000 pounds of wildfire and wildlife recovery seed, that's about 179 acres. That mix is specifically designed to help uh, provide forage for wildlife uh, in these landscapes that are completely devoid of, of vegetation. About 330 bales of straw were distributed. Doesn't sound like a lot, but then it only is about six acres. So that was very targeted. We were looking at you know places where we were maybe we're seeing some evidence of erosion places where you know there was a lot of vehicle activity and so the soils are really disturbed or steep slopes where things are going to start to erode so we actually had that program both for Almeda and for open chain so this is just the stats for for Alme for for open chain we did uh, get some material out to open chain as well um, and then, so this fuels reduction work so far to date, we've done about 47 acres. Um, we're hoping to get about a, uh, about 100 acres of this really targeted work. Again, uh, doing some of that initial hazard tree removal, a lot of side hill log placement to prevent uh, erosion, particularly the, above streams or in places where you have some steep slopes and severely burned uh, soils trying to get to some of that slash that was created either from this forestry work or from dozer lines or other you know, other forestry work. Um, and then in a couple of places where it's made sense, we've actually been able to extend that work out and just do some fuels reduction and defensible space around homes. Um, so I, I sort of just like, just sort of brain dumped and said, what kind of work would we like to see done out in this area based on these site visits that we've had? So, you know, what we really wanted to do is start taking information that we're seeing from these site visits and saying, hey, you know, we saw this as an opportunity. Let's squirrel this away in our brain so that if we have some funding later on, we can we can come back to these landowners we're working with and maybe help get some of this work done. So again, more post-fire uh, 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 forestry work, everything from hazard tree, pine beetle mitigation, shrub management over the next couple of years is going to be critical to uh, to maintain some of these fire breaks that were put in and to just keep fuels low um, while still managing some of these areas for wildlife habitat. Um, of course, 
like any wildfire, it was uh, very spotty. There were places I completely adjacent to each other that one place is completely destroyed another place and right next to it is a nice dense stand of old Ceanothus that didn't burn for some bizarre reason. So there's still a lot of fuels reduction and thinning that work that can be done out there. Um, one place in particular that we're noticing is this public private interface. Uh, there's a lot of BLM land on these areas and it's kind of a struggle to have a conversation with landowners about telling them that they should cut down all these pine because we're afraid that it's going to spawn uh, pine beetle outbreaks. And then they look across the fence to the, to the BLM side and they see this entire scorched earth and not really sure if the BLM is going to have some funding uh, to be able to go in and do the work on their side. Um, so what I'd like to explore is some op opportunities to work with the BLM to at least treat that right along each side of those private public fence lines to create some fuel breaks um, and you know protect fence lines, that sort of thing. Um, riparian restoration, um, while there's not a lot of riparian area that was impacted by this fire, certainly not to the level that, the, that we saw in the Almeda fire, there is quite a bit of work that, that can be done. And of particular interest is uh, places where this riparian area is adjacent to pasture land. So a lot of people were using that blackberry that burned as fencing for these riparian areas. And now that fencing fencing is gone because it burned. Um, so now's a great opportunity to get in and work with those landowners to keep the blackberry out, replant these areas with native vegetation, and to put up some good fencing to protect water quality. Reese Creek in particular, as that is a, a pretty solid tributary to the Rogue and can impact some uh, downstream public water systems. Uh, rangeland restoration and management. Again, a lot of this rangeland stuff was burned. And so getting into replanting some of that would be great. Um, you know, we every time we work with landowners, we're always looking for ag water quality improvements, everything from heavy use areas, pasture management, erosion control, stormwater infrastructure, all that. Um, We've also talked to a lot of the communities out there about getting some firewise communities established out there. So working with like Herb Johnson with ODF um, to help these communities sort of band together and do some of this, um, do some of this uh, firewise planning. And then of course, down the road, certainly uh, reforestation is another thing that we wanna talk about as well and hoping to maybe work with the FSA and some other programs to, to get that work done as well. Um, so, I wanted to, again, I'm doing a lot of brain dump here um, to try and talk about where some of the funding to get some of this work done could potentially come from. Um, and honestly, from the district's perspective, we have the capability and the, and the, and the, the experience and the, and the community support to really be able to be the sort of the grease in the wheels to sort of uh, facilitate a lot of healthy conversation between landowners and the bureaucracy that a lot of our agencies inflict on people. Um, but I don't know that our agency has the capacity to put together something as large and um, comprehensive as something that's like, for example, is being done out in West Bear. Um, so this is my opportunity to just kind of throw out this idea that if there if there's somebody that's willing and able and has a capacity to help us wrangle this beast of working um, in this area, uh, it would be really helpful. Um, you know, that's definitely a partnership that I think the district will be supportive of. Um, you know, again, I, I won't go through this list, but you know, most of this these funding sources are pretty, pretty, uh, uh, are pretty, uh, pretty well known to to most of the people on the call here. Um, there's a great opportunity here, not only from the resource concerns that I've kind of outlined, but the but the landowner support um, that typically is a very difficult thing to get, especially out in this community. They tend to be a little bit more hesitant to work with the government. Um, so this has really been an opportunity for us to get in and, and show people that we're not big and scary, that we are here to help and we are here to respect landowners uh, goals for their property and just help them get to those goals instead of telling them what to do. Um, with that, I think I saw some comments. Um, so maybe I will see if I can try and look at those comments. Um, or maybe I'll stop my sharing. Anyway, uh, maybe I'll just ask real quick that what kind of questions does people have um, at this point and then just kind of see what I got here. Um, 
Oh, cool. So looks like Megan was talking a little bit about species mixes. That's great. <laughs> Hi, Kelly. Yeah, any other questions that came up that somebody didn't put in there in the, in the chat? Hey, Clint, that was that's that comment I threw in there was directed, you know, obviously for me. So we, give me give me a chat sometime and we can talk about our how our program can can uh, help out too. So yeah, we'll do. Uh, really quickly too, since Cali was speaking up, I just want to mention that uh, what a great partner U.S. Fish and Wildlife and Cali have been helping us to provide uh, Endangered Species Act coverage across all of our project areas. They have, uh, he in particular, and they have just done a tremendous job in, in bringing resources and, and, and capacity to our partnership. I mean, I, really, you deserve a bow. I mean, the, the you ESA are welcome. coverage the ESA coverage coming directly from you and you being willing to step in, whether it's Ashland, whether it's Oak Woodlands, whether it's now in the Green Springs, or it's really just been invaluable. I just want to say thank you, really. Um, and so, um, you know, Nate, Nate Adelman is our basin resource conservationist and um, we've had some emergency programs, some post wildfire emergency programs for the West side and uh, Nate's been pretty instrumental in developing implementation strategies for, for this. And so I was wondering if maybe I couldn't have Nate just come in and talk about post wildfire um, strategies and uh, potential programs that we may have for some folks. That's okay. Yeah, sure. Sure thing. Thanks, Nate. Um, so yeah, this last fall, we had some funding available just on the real um, erosion and hazard tree removal. And we've gone through that and had some signups really west-wide. Um, and so from that, we are we have available here for this April 16th a, a, a sign-up deadline to um, target um, um, people affected from the Labor Day fires uh, from this last uh, 2020 season. And uh, looking at more on the restoration side of it. So everything from erosion, um, but also uh, site prep and planting and, and things just needed to restore sites. Um, again, the, the sign up deadline for that's gonna be April 16th. And that's using our environmental quality incentives program for funding um, um, this year. Um, again, the funding is gonna be um, focused for those Labor Day fires uh, within our Southwest and, and Central Coast Upper Willamette Basins. So that would include Oven Chain Fire as well as Archie and Douglas Fires and pretty much all the West Side Fires. Yep, sure will. Okay, and there might be some other opportunities we can discuss in the, in the discussion portion. Um, if nobody has any questions, I uh, want to introduce Brett Harris from the uh, Farm Service Agency. Uh, he was just going to give an update on the Farm Service Agency and kind of their goings hey, on. Some hey, of their Pete. Programs. Yeah. I don't want to. I don't want to make this a uh, an a JSWCD show, but uh, I I think I talked a little too long. I want to make sure Megan has a chance to talk a little bit about the. <laughs> now she's shaking her head. <laughs> I can bring my piece up at the at the end. I think okay. it's fine. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Cool. Sure. Sorry, Megan. <laughs> No problem. I'm glad I was a little bit early because this is the part of the, this is really the meat of it is really talking to partners and figuring out where we're all at and uh, what we want to do. So this is really the important part. Um, anyway, maybe I'll, Brett, Brett, I think is usually pretty brief and, uh, but I'd like to introduce Brett Harris from Farm Service Agency. He is uh, down in Coquille, uh, taking care of Coquille and Coos, Cur Coos and Curry. And uh, for a long time, I think he was taking care of Douglas, Jackson, Josephine, Coos and Curry. But uh, I think he's now back just at home in Coos and Curry now. So he's uh, maybe you can step in, Brett, and give us a little update on Farm Service Agency. Yeah, you're you're not done with me till the end of the month. So maybe a first part of next month, I still get to haunt Jackson County, but then I get to come home. Um, just real quick, I want to mention a couple things. Uh, we talked about different people talked about the the fire response. Uh, FSA had two programs basically that assisted with that. 
One was uh, emergency conservation program. We actually had three signups for that program in Jackson County for a requested cost share of a little over $41,000. And we also had the emergency forestry restoration program. We had 19 applications for that program, a little bit in, in excess of $10 million requested for assistance under that program. So hopefully that funding will be approved shortly from the new administration in DC and we'll be able to assist those landowners. Um, real quickly, the only real deadline that's coming up for us that we know about is our ARC PLC program. March 15th is the deadline. If you haven't participated, if you don't, don't know what that is, you're probably okay. If you do know what it is and you haven't got your sign up done, please do so. One of our biggest conservation programs is the Conservation Reserve Program. That's the biggest one, biggest federal conservation program in the nation. Uh, our sign up was supposed to end on the 12th of February for this year, did not do so, it got extended. We don't know the ending date. The only thing we do know is that there is a offshoot of that program, CRP grassland sign up, which will happen shortly after the end of the regular CRP sign up. So stay tuned for that one. One other thing that I wanted to mention real quickly, USDA, FSA and NRCS work closely together. We do a lot of eligibility work for NRCS programs. For some NRCS customers, there are some new requirements for eligibility, that being our form CCC 902, which we call a farm operating plan. Basically what that's gonna determine is, are you eligible for payment? Where do you fit in the payment limitation structure? Are you a US citizen? Are you not under 18? It's pretty basic stuff, but that will be required for eligibility for NRCS programs as well as FSA programs now, uh, in addition to our annual uh, gross income certification and the highly erodible land and wetland certification. So keep that in mind. You may have to do some additional eligibility documents than you're used to if you're going to participate in NRCS programs in the future. As far as ongoing disaster assistance programs, a couple I want to mention, uh, the non-insured assistance program, NAP, that's basically for any crop that's not covered by federal crop insurance. So if you have crops that fit in that category, uh, my recommendation is that you get a hold of FSA and I'm gonna say, please contact our relatively new program tech in the Jackson Josephine County office, Jolene Stucker. She will be more than happy to assist you in getting through that process. One other one I wanna mention real quickly is the emergency assistance for livestock, honeybees and farm raised fish, ELAP. That one we're doing some work with honeybee producers that were affected by different natural disasters, including the fires, smoke damage, colony loss, colony collapse, things like that. And then there's also the tree assistance program, which is TAP. And that's for qualifying natural disasters for trees, vines, shrubs, things of that nature. Those three programs in particular, and basically all of our disaster programs require what we call a notice of loss, which has to be submitted to FSA within a specified time frame, And that would be 15 days from the date of the disaster or 15 days from when the notice, when the loss becomes apparent because sometimes it's not apparent right away. So make sure you keep those dates in mind. If you have a loss on an agricultural crop, grazing lands, forest, and you think it might be something that could be covered, just give FSA a call. And then kind of along those same lines, 
you do have a loss that you think could be under a covered program, the most important thing that you need to do is document, 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 take pictures, uh, provide extemporaneous records, calendar of events, all those kind of things, because we end up trying to piece together what happened sometimes months down the road. So we have to have that information to make sure you maintain eligibility for programs. That's a quick synopsis of some FSA stuff that's going on right now. Be happy to answer any questions now or drop me a email or whatever and we will see if we can help you out. You're up, Peter. Thank you, Brett. I appreciate it. And again, Farm Services Agency, uh, you know, if you don't know, they're, they're incredibly helpful. Everybody who signs up for any of our programs goes through Farm Service eligibility to have their farm, the electronic records developed as well as their eligibility. And so uh, we'd have a lot of trouble doing what we do without Farm Service Agency as well as their programs and very helpful folks there. So thank you. Um, and last, before we get into the open discussion, it wasn't on the agenda, but um, <clears throat> I wanted to give a couple of moments to uh, both Craig Harper and John Spies, they want to just kind of give you guys a little rundown of some really uh, some kind of neat work that's going on uh, in the county right now. Uh, and Craig from the Medford Water Commission wants to talk about the Rogue Drinking Water Partnership. And John Spies from Rogue River Watershed Council is just going to give us a quick rundown on the National Water Quality Initiative they're working on. And uh, what's interesting is going down the road when, um, well, I'll let John talk and then we can talk about it afterwards. So uh, if you guys are good, I will bring up your, um, let me see if I can bring this up for you. I just bring up the map, Pete, that'd be helpful. Okay, uh, that's the wrong one. Tiny, tiny map. I was gonna say technology is not my, uh, <laughs> exactly, exactly my thing here. I'm working on it though. No, you're good. You guys seeing the map at this point? Or are you guys seeing the, uh, what are you guys seeing here? Oh, the map's there. There's the your email. There. Now, now we're seeing your emails. No, really? Yeah. <laughs> okay, let me stop, let's drop this again. Anyway, while you're, while you're getting that up there, Peter, I'll just give the introduction to um, the Road Drinking Water Partnership. And so I work for the Medford Water Commission. I'm the watershed administrator. And the Medford Water Commission provides drinking water to about 140,000 people in the Rogue Valley. Um, first off, can everybody hear me pretty well? You bet. Okay, good. Um, and about four years ago, we banded with other community water suppliers in the Rogue to form the Rogue Drinking Water Partnership, uh, along with other natural resource agencies, including the SWCD and um, the Rogue, Rogue River Watershed Council and others in the area to really to do two things, to kind of raise awareness and uh, kind of elevate concerns of, for our, drink, our supplies of drinking water and our sources, and also then to help protect drinking water. And so, in that process, you know, we worked with everybody from like Grants, the city of Grants Pass to the city of Ashland, all the way up to um, city of uh, Shady Cove and other kind of small uh, water suppliers up there. And so um, in that process, that includes drinking water, uh, you know, people who drink water from the Rogue River, about 180,000 folks. And so, you know, one of the things we really wanted to make sure that that the drinking water providers did was to help people understand, you know, how our drinking water sources, how uh, really uh, leads to the quality of the drinking water that comes out of your tap. And so, yeah, you know, it's all treated, um, you know, and, and water that comes out of your tap necessarily um, can be contaminated. But, you know, the standard things like bacteria, sediment, those kind of things are fairly, I should say, easily removed by treatment plants. And a lot of times people just say, well, I turn on my tap and there's my water. But, you know, what we what we tried to make people realize is that um, the more treatment or, you know, 
the, the more protection is done to, to source water, the less treatment at the treatment plant that has to occur and the better the quality of the water. So anyway, we formed this uh, partnership. Um, and then about, well, I guess after the 2018 farm bill, um, I saw you know in a webinar, they were talking about how 10% of the funding for the farm bill had to go to drinking water projects. And of course, you know, most of the things that NRCS and the SWCD do are benefit drinking water quality, but that still left some areas that um, we could focus on. And we talked with the state NRCS, the state conservationists and, and other folks who are familiar with this National Water Quality Initiative Program. And John will talk more about it, but um, we're able to get some interest in a project here in the Rogue and uh, obtain some funding to help us do some work that I think will be a really good initiative for future projects. So John, if you wanna take it from there, it'd be great. Sure, thanks, Craig. Uh, yeah, I'll quickly just kind of uh, follow up on what Craig said there. And so it was uh, probably spring 2019, I think Aaron Kurtz, uh, who was a previous district conservationist, approached us at the uh, Rogue Drinking Water Partnership to in uh, Mary Beth at the state NRCS and also DEQ, um, source water protection specialist, um, talked with us about pursuing this Rogue uh, uh, National Water Quality Initiative project. And so we did that and uh, we were awarded that in the spring of 2020 bringing funding to the area to focus on um, addressing agricultural resource concerns in specific upper rogue watersheds. And I don't think you're able to see that map, but um, those watersheds, Clint and Megan, I, I kind of mentioned some of these are Clint did, but uh, Indian Creek, uh, Reese Creek, Lick Creek, Knutchen and Little Butte Creek, Whetstone Creek and Lower Antelope Creek. So what this is, it's a partnership among NRCS, state water quality agencies, and US uh, EPA to improve and protect water quality through voluntary conservation actions. This is about a two year project, uh, develop this source water protection plan uh, with goals and objectives of identify and prioritize key critical areas within that protection area identify practices that will address agricultural threats to water quality within that production area, increase coordination among like groups like this uh, between local state and regional entities to address non-point sources of pollutants in that area. Uh, and then with the long-term result of increasing the capacity of current partners to, to take some, get some on the ground dollars to address those resource concerns that are identified. So this kind of wraps nicely into what Pete said about spending time developing these plans that would roll up into potentially a future CIS. Um, and so that's what the NWQI is. It's local partners doing some work so Pete can take that body of work and go bring dollars into the area to address those resource concerns. Um, with the ultimate uh, kind of long-term goal of reducing levels of nutrient sediment pesticides, et cetera, in these source water areas. So drinking water providers downstream, the Medford Water Commission, Road River, Gold Hill, it ultimately reduces treatment costs, provides uh, better water quality, benefiting aquatic life, et cetera, uh, and working together in partnerships to get that work done. And currently right now, we are through phase one of uh, the plan. Uh, we're going into phase two. So we'll bring in uh, additional partners for some meetings uh, later this spring to kind of update everyone on that. Uh, and currently, uh, right now, the Rogue Valley Council of Governments is under contract to develop that plan. Um, with that being said, that's the quick elevator speech that we were tasked with putting together. So uh, if you have any questions, follow up with Craig or I, um, and uh, we'll go from there. So thank you. Yeah, are you are you guys not seeing the map? Still in trouble. Can you guys hear me? We're seeing we're seeing the we're seeing the word document now. Okay, so let me see. If the I map can... did come up for a bit. Yeah, there there it is. is. Is that better? Okay. Sorry. That's why I, I'm glad I have an IT guy on uh, on staff here. So you can see it's a pretty large area. Uh, I think it's 
500,000 acres, maybe almost, or a couple hundred thousand. I can't remember what the total acreage was. I think the original proposal was maybe a half million acres. We pulled out the uh, uh, industrial forest land and focused on agriculture areas. So it's probably half that, uh, but it's a big chunk in the middle row there that we'd be focusing on uh, a source water protection plan on. Yeah. Hey, John. Yeah, oh, Kelly. Sorry, Pete, go ahead. You were gonna say something? Oh, I was just going to paraphrase, but um, I'm sure it's probably not needed. What I was going to say is it, it, John laid it out exactly right. This National Water Quality Initiative plan that they're working on is really going to lead us into CIS development to figure out where to best make the investment to address water quality. And so this is the early stages of really creating that guidance document that's going to help our investment with other partners um, going down the road. So it's really timely because I mean, I don't know what your expected, you know, timeline is, John, but you're still, you know, a year or so. Is, is that about right? Probably. Yep. Okay. Um, Heather's got something to add real quick. Great. Heather, go ahead. Heather, please. Hey, Pete, just wanted to clarify there are potentially once the plan gets completed for NWQI, there are potentially some national funds that could be available for implementation. If those national funds are not available, you, we would just take the NWQI plan that's developed. And then what we have said in Oregon, Oregon leadership team has said that we would use our general equip funds for implementation. That's what our directive is from the state conservationist. Okay. And yeah, and with uh, you know, our resource concerns, our priority resource concerns being, you know, forest forest wildfire hazard and water quality. This just really lends into our priority resource concerns as they've always been in this county. So I really am looking forward to um, where this goes, John, quite honestly. So thank you. And uh, you know, other folks that are interested in water quality, this is a good opportunity. Um, sorry, who did I interrupt there? That was Cal Lee, right? Yeah, well, uh, it, it's okay, Pete. Uh, I was just, John, I was just gonna throw it out and I don't know how at what stage you are, if this is kind of still in a draft format or what, whatever. And I, you know, as I kind of review or see what you've got there, one of the things that, you know, it's pretty obvious reach uh, to add an, uh, another partner, and I would just say us, but another couple partners in uh, with like the National Marine Fisheries Service, uh, if you could tie in a uh, canary in the coal mine, if you will, aspect of uh, federally listed like coho salmon into this water quality initiative uh, and and tack in another metric there uh, you you stay on the potential to bring in other partner dollars to help the cause great yeah we'll we'll uh we'll keep that in mind as we're pushing forward and, and identifying those resource concerns and uh listing uh supporting documents and pieces to do that. Sure. Thanks, Kelly. Yep. Um, well, thank you guys. I appreciate that. Um, so, you know, I guess uh, this is a time to really open it up to really any discussion that anybody wants to have that, you know, projects are interested, things they're doing, resource concerns we want to look at moving forward. And, um, you know, so I, I don't know if Megan, you want to, you had a couple things you wanted to say about kind of some district uh, goals, if you want to step in. Yeah, um, I, yeah, just to give other people the opportunity, I didn't talk after Clint, um, but can share my screen. Oh, wait, maybe I can't. Um, I have a couple slides just looking at um, some novel agricultural crops in the valley and um, ideas for, for working on conservation initiatives with that. Um, but as, as all of us are quite fully aware, um, hemp was legalized federally in under the 2018 Farm Bill and absolutely exploded in production in Jackson County. Um, so this past year was a little bit lower in terms of acreage under production than in 2019, um, but the 2020 growing season, there were 8,579 acres registered for hemp production in Jackson County, um, which is the by far the largest acreage in the state, um, probably by like a quarter um, or a third more than any other county. Um, and this growth in hemp cultivation um, has raised a lot of concerns, both among nat natural resource professionals and 
other growers and neighboring landowners um, about the some, some concerns over how the production practices impact soil health and water quality around the valley. So um, we've seen that hemp growers really have a, a range of cultivation knowledge from um, very skilled and experienced to, um, to be frank, to be uh, to completely clueless as to what they're doing. Um, and I've also found, at least in, I've, I've been with the district for a year and in my, con my conversations with growers, um, that a lot of people are are fairly open to learning more about alternative production practices or ways to pr protect those resources, or people who are already starting to adopt those and they just need a little bit more assistance, um, whether that's technical or financial. So um, we've been talking at the district um, over the past year about what kinds of opportunities there exist for um, implementing things like winter cover cropping, um, better uh, nutrient pesticide herbicide management, differing weed control strategies, um, potentially reducing the use of plastic row coverings, um, which tend to pers persist in the soil over the winter season because they don't get removed at the end of the growing season. Um, and then another large topic of conversation is the how you go about restoring or rehabilitating abandoned grows um, so that they don't just lay as as fallow fields that are either bare soil or sources for noxious weeds for neighboring producers. Um, so I don't have necessarily a, like a, a specific like plan or pitch, but talking a little bit with Pete and with Randy, our, our manager at the district and some other partners um, with OSU Extension as well, um, some of the practices that could be included in a potential CIS um, that would focus on soil health and water quality in particular. So things like cover cropping, composting, crop rotation, uh, nutrient management planning, integrated pest management strategies. So. Yeah, it might, might be the only hemp CIS in the entire country. That'd be pretty, pretty good. Pretty interesting. Um, thank you, Megan, appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, really again, and, and I'm happy to stay. I know we're supposed to you know, adjourn at 11.30, but I'm willing to stay as long as anybody really wants to keep chatting about stuff. But, uh, you know, does anybody else want to chime in about, you know, what you're doing, where you'd like to see us moving? Um, you know, a lot of times with the CIS, we can work with multiple um, resource concerns, you know. Um, same thing within the forest. It's forest fire. It's, it's forest health. It's uh, wildlife habitat. I mean, we can build a lot of these things into uh, the type of thing, you know, in, in, into our implementation strategy. So it's really just, it's interesting and good to know that, you know, if people are interested in trying to address some of these other concerns as well. Hey, Pete, I did want to just take the opportunity with the stage you have here and, and appreciate you, you know, put, pulling together the meeting and everything like that. But I'd be a little bit remiss if I didn't, uh, from, a, <clears throat> from a U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service perspective, talk about the plight of our pollinators. And, uh, that was why I wanted to mention yay pollinators when you uh, when you talked about the hedgerow stuff earlier. But um, just a little sad, sordid update uh, about our Western monarch population. If you haven't all heard, um, our Western monarch butterfly population, is, of course, comes through Jackson County. So it's kind of uh, that's the first uh, first county in the between it and Klamath County are the first counties uh, in the state. Oregon, where where uh, where the monarchs fly north from uh, from California, and uh, we hit an all we've now hit an all time low of nine thousand uh, in the Western monarch population, down from four million uh, not too many years ago. So uh, <clears throat> I say that because of the you know like I said, using the stage here uh, in all the work that all of you are doing around Jackson County County. Uh, with it, anything you're working on, um, just be thinking about like incorporating any sort of pollinator opportunities as Pete was talking about earlier. Plant milkweed, uh, plant pollinator, uh, nectaring plants. Um, you know, we're uh, it, hopefully we're not at a point where we're, you know, too little too late, but we might, we might already be there. Um, so if there's any opportunities that any of you are working on where, uh, uh, you see opportunity or a need for uh, pollinator seeds, 
I, you know, I would put Sean on the on the spot, uh, but I'm, I, I don't know if he's on or not. But uh, yes. working with uh, with with Sean and in the understory initiative, uh, we're we're trying to put together a locally sourced native uh, pollinator seed mix. So um, we have that available for private landowner use. So do you want to say anything, Sean? Yeah. Sorry. No. Thanks for kicking that off, Kelly. Uh, I echo everything uh, Kelly said and, and did want to take the opportunity to mention that we are working on that seed mix. Um, and several points have been raised uh, that make me think there are opportunities to, to put a seed mix to use um, that would benefit pollinators and other uh, wildlife that would be uh, based on native bunch grasses and wildflowers. Um, and the more that seed we could produce, the more it could be integrated into uh, oak woodland habitat restoration, uh, other types of more open woodland and forest uh, restoration projects, uh, pollinator hedgerows on farms, and also these wildfire areas. Um, I would love to see uh, at least a slow transition to uh, wild uh, pollinator friendly uh, native species mix that we could put into burned areas to replace some of the um, uh, pasture grasses and things like that not to denigrate the work anyone's doing seeding those areas because it's good work for, for wildlife habitat. But if we could uh, work together uh, to develop a seed mix that could be put onto those areas uh, that does include native wildflowers, that would be great. Um, and I will uh, touch base with Pete. Pete, thanks for inviting us and thanks for uh, uh, putting this together. Um, would love to, to circle up and see how we could either just integrate uh, pollinator seeding. I know we've discussed this before. We've been hard at work at trying to develop the seed mix so that we have seed to put on these projects. Um, would love to circle up though and see how we can work on either integrating pollinator habitat into a current or uh, future CIS or, or a pollinator specific CIS if that's appropriate. Um, but if anyone else has uh, ideas for, for uh, native plants uh, for wildlife uh, habitat restoration or conservation or for pollinator work. Um, just uh, feel free to reach out to us at the Understory Initiative and would love to work with NRCS and Jackson Swan Water Conservation District uh, even more in the future on those issues. So thank you for the time. Well, and uh, can you guys hear me? Um, and, you know, Andrew Owen, our state forester, has joined us a little bit. And so Maybe you can shed some light, but within our implementation strategies in the forest, we have conservation cover as a practice. And um, I'm not sure if we had availability of seed, I'm not sure why we couldn't incorporate that a little bit more to get some of those seed mixes out. Um, you know, at some point we tried to do it in the, you know, the areas of the slash piles, but, you know, there might be some open meadows within our areas and other things. And so I think we actually have a working mechanism to maybe start doing that some right now. I mean, Andrew, am I... <laughs> You, you nailed it, Pete. And, yep, no, you, you nailed it. We have the current, um, we have the, the current post wildfire CIS for the 2020 Labor Day fires that, that impacted up and down the west side. And those do have specific practices and quite a bit of latitude within the practices for the seed mixes that are deployed, that, that, are, that are used. So uh, I would definitely look into those existing specs and see what can be applied. And if there's changes that are needed, I think we, we've got the ability and the bandwidth to to expand those for, for other reasons. Uh, Pete, I feel like I'm, I'm like walking to do a movie halfway through, so I apologize, I had another meeting, but uh, I know when we talk pre-meeting, uh, I can touch really quickly and, and I'm keeping an eye on time, so I'll be brief, but there is a partner-led effort um, on the west side of the Cascades to address some of the wildfire, more longer-term thinking, more longer-term restorations uh, through a group uh, group-led effort, partner-driven through Sustainable Northwest. They're looking at um, just now starting to socialize the idea behind a, a RCPP, which Regional Conservation Partnership Program. So Pete wanted me just to bring that up really quick, let everybody know that there is a group looking at doing. Um, at this point, it looks like it's going to cover the majority of the 2020 Labor Day fires on the west side. It's going to be somewhat of a narrow band of practices. Um, focused on, on erosion control methods and reforestation efforts. So more to come on that, but I just wanted to help them socialize the idea. It's, it's pretty uh, infancy stages at this point, but I think there's gonna be a really strong effort in the next few years to come. Uh, happy to- that's a, that's a bigger RCPP that covers like all the fire areas, not just- That's what they're, tell me that's that. what they're looking at doing, yep. yep. Okay. 
to help. It's, it's kind of a, a, a double fold, if you will. One is to get the practices and to get the funding flowing, but also to help coordinate at a, at a larger level. There's obviously seeding, seedling shortages. So, so the hope is that they can help facilitate that where we don't have um, inter-fire competition over those resources. We can help facilitate that a little bit more streamlined. Nice. Rachel, did you have a question? Uh, thanks. Yeah, I, I just wanted to kind of just weigh in or chime in and really give support to that idea. So I'm, uh, I, I know a lot of the folks here, but not everybody. I have the Land Steward Program, which is uh, private landowner education through OSU Extension. And I'm also the current president for the Siskiyou chapter of the Native Plant Society. And when we're talking, and I know that uh, I'm talking to the choir and a lot of people understand this, but I just wanted to elevate the idea that the native pollinators are, are, most of them are really host specific to our native plants. And a lot of our native birds have to feed larval insects to their young. And so we're really supporting this big web. It's not, we talk about pollinators, but a lot of times we don't make that link of that we need caterpillars eating the plants to feed the birds when they're young. So I just wanted to throw that out as another thing to kind of have in our minds. Well, and I, th I think working, you know, with some of the plan development, again, I mentioned the Oregon Department of Forestry NRCS agreement where uh, ODF is doing a lot of the, you know, forestry plan development on the front end. And I think it's a good opportunity for them to work with landowners to introduce the idea of the conservation cover. And, you know, especially if they have that objective, we could potentially work that into some of the open areas uh, within the forest and maybe some of the burn piles and really get some of that moving in the existing structure we already have to do so. So um, I'll probably meet with uh, Kelly and, and uh, Nick and, and Jake and my local ODF guys and, and discuss that a little bit because we don't need to reinvent the wheel. We have it. We're there. So um, it's really good input. Thumbs up. Okay, good. Um, well, anyway, uh, is, I mean, really, it's an open forum, you know, if anybody wants to chat, um, anything else, if not, um, we are always available, I'm always available, you can email me, you can call me, uh, anything you want, and we're happy to chat about it. This is always a work in progress, and we're trying to get better at what we do, and um, trying to serve more people, and trying to bring in more partners, and just up our capacity, and our outputs with everybody, so thank you guys for taking the time, I really appreciate it. Hey, Pete, one last thing. I'm going to put Sean on the spot one more time just to throw in a couple of uh, other partnership opportunities that, <clears throat> that you're involved in, as well as many of us on the, on the call are involved in. But uh, just from a, from a you know, we've, Pete's talked about the Climate Siskiyou Oak Network historically, and Aaron has too. Um, obviously, these uh, more locally led uh, working groups, habitat specific or, you know, pollinator specific type things uh, that are going on in the area. So I wanted to let folks know that <clears throat> the Quezon is still an act, you know, a fairly active working group. We're in the middle of a strategic planning process there, uh, working on a lot of the oak habitats in the, uh, in the area down there. Uh, but also two other things that, uh, that we're involved in, Pete's involved in, others are involved in, Sean. Uh, and his wife, Catherine, are, are actually leading the other two efforts are the Southwest Oregon Pollinator Collaborative, uh, or SWAPIC, and, uh, and the Rogue Native Plant Partnership. And these are both, uh, you know, again, working groups that, are, uh, that feed into a lot of the different either CISs that could, you know, formulate here or, uh, or some of the on-the-ground initiatives that, that everybody's got going on. So, Sean, do you want to say anything about those two things? Well, the only other thing I'll say is that uh, we are uh, bringing farmers into the fold to grow uh, native seed in Southwest Oregon as sort of a new crop uh, for the area. Most of the seed that is grown out for the area is either grown on farms in other parts of the state or country or uh, at the uh, Stone Nursery, which is a Forest Service facility. Uh, but there are niche crops uh, that are being grown by local farmers as a Rogue Native Plant Partnership initiative that will produce uh, seed and wild, uh, grass and wildflower seed uh, for pollinator projects that could go into oak and prairie <clears throat> uh, and riparian habitat restoration uh, and, uh, and build pollinator habitat. So uh, it's sort of uh, um, a cohesive uh, thing we're trying to build so that we 
uh, look to, to restore these ecosystems using native seed uh, and keeping pollinators and birds in mind and other types of wild habitat or wildlife that would uh, benefit from the habitat improvements of, of these native plants. Uh, so we're trying to kind of cover all our bases there and integrate into the other work that uh, folks are doing. Um, and so if you have questions about native plants and, and the availability of native plant materials uh, or pollinator habitat uh, work, we have funding uh, through Fish and Wildlife Service to do technical assistance for, for farmers uh, and for, for pollinator habitat installation. So uh, reach out and, and Pete, uh, I'd love to talk more this summer uh, and look at some maps of where we could actually, when we get our first batch of seed this fall, where we could actually put that on the ground. Um, so to actually move that forward, we've been working on the grow out so far, but uh, let's let's actually put it on the ground. Yeah, and that's great to have the capacity. That's been a little bit of an issue in the past is where we're gonna get this seed. So it was a little bit hard to maybe contract folks or you know approach them with it, so. We'd love to help. Thank you, appreciate it. Um, Kylie, I think we're there. So I, thank you guys really for taking your time. I really, really appreciate it. And uh, hopefully next year we can do this in person. And hopefully we'll have more to report next year and uh, we'll just keep driving forward. I love the partnerships in this county. I love the folks we work with, the capacity. Everybody's so local, everybody does a great job. And uh, I feel very grateful. Uh, the way NRCS does business through the strategic approach, I think it would be very difficult without the depth of partnerships. And I feel sort of bad for some folks in other counties that don't quite have what we have going in Jackson County. And so really thank you guys for taking your time and uh, all your brain power and your dedication. And uh, it, it really shows. So, thank you. Thanks Pete for, for your leadership and putting all this together. It's good seeing everybody. Well, and thanks to Kat, Kathy and Kylie. They helped me. I was a little bit, a little bit, you know, a little worried, you know, not, not, not so great at public speaking, but I really appreciate them helping me a little bit through this and um, all the friendly faces really helps as well too. So thank you. I did good. It was a good meeting. Thanks everybody. Thanks. Absolutely. Thanks everyone. All right. Great seeing y'all. Take care. Call me, call me anytime. All right. Okay. Thanks. Later. Bye.